Ellington campus. There's a reason why we picked this particular room, because every time I've been here, I've just been amazed at the craftsmanship of this room, and the fact that uh, it's, a, it's a natural place where my voice can carry. So can everyone hear me clearly at the back there? Yeah. Good. Um, so my name is Alistair McGregor, and I'm a member of Parliamentary Couch in Malahat Langford, and this forum is the third town hall I've had this summer. I had one on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, on climate change, and now on electoral reform. And the reason why I'm hosting this, and many of my colleagues are doing the same across Canada, is because right now there are 12 members of Parliament who have effectively given up their summers in their home writings to sit on the Special Committee on Electoral Reform in Ottawa. And they've been sitting throughout the summer, and they're going to be continuing their work right through the fall. And their job is to basically solicit um, feedback from experts, uh, from witnesses, and from the everyday public, so that they can compile a report that they will present to the government of Canada on December the 1st. And that report, it is hoped, will form the basis for the government's decision on what type of legislation they want to introduce for 2017. Um, the reason that I wanted to have this town hall tonight was because I feel that it's very important to solicit feedback <coughs> on a weighty subject like this from the constituents that you actually represent. So tonight is uh, going to be an informative look at both what our current system does, at what some of the alternatives are, and what you'll notice is that in every single seat, I've put a feedback form. So that's a way for me to, to get your feedback after you've had some information. And I'm going to use that feedback as well as any other type of written communications you want to send me as a part of the final report that I will submit to the special committee next month. And members of parliament, as I mentioned, are doing this all across the country. Now, as I, uh, I couldn't be doing this this presentation alone. So I'd like everyone to uh, be introduced to Mark Williams. Mark Williams is a professor of political studies at Vancouver Island University, and he's going to be conducting uh, the explanation part on the alternative voting systems that are used across the world. And we also have a representative from Fair Vote Canada, Terry Dance-Bennick. So if you can all just extend a warm round of applause. For And before I continue, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, that we are hosting this meeting on the traditional territories of the Cowichan people, and uh, it's a great honor to share this wonderful piece of land with them. So the next slide that I'm going to present to you uh, just looks at what the agenda for tonight's discussion is. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be just showing uh, what our current system is like. Uh, and then we're going to look at what the timeline is for the possible reform of the system. And then we're going to have Mark take over and look at the, uh, the alternatives that are used around the world. So our current system, the first past the post, uh, it has been used in Canada for every Canadian federal election since Confederation. And it has also been used before that. It's, uh, it's a very easy system to understand. Um, basically, you know, every province is allocated federal electoral districts, known as ridings, based on a formula set out in the Constitution Act, 1867. And there are provisions in the Constitution that allows the Parliament of Canada, from time to time, to increase the number of seats as Canada's population both grows and changes from province to province. And it's an attempt to sort of balance out the population irregularities. And of course, we're very familiar with that here on Vancouver Island because we have a new riding here. And as a result, all of the boundaries across Vancouver Island were also changed. Now, the important thing to realize about the Constitution is that it doesn't contain any specific reference that mentions how Canada's members of parliament have to be voted. It only basically contains provisions stating when elections have to be, like for example, like a parliament may not continue past the five year mark without having a general election. Um, the main statute uh, that deals with this is the Canada Elections Act. So it is an act of parliament. 
And the reference comes in, you know, you know, section 313 that basically contains a reference to the fact that the returning officer shall declare elected the candidate who obtains the largest number of votes. That, that is your reference. So because of the virtue that it is an act of parliament means that it is within parliament's domain and authority to actually change the Canada Elections Act. But in order to do such a substantive thing, we need to have feedback from the population because a lot of people are not very familiar with the other systems that do exist. Now, the strengths of the current system. Um, it certainly does favor the installation of strong majority governments who are well equipped by that majority to carry out a legislative agenda. Um, we've seen it in the 2011 election when the Conservatives were returned with a majority and of course just last year when the Liberals got a strong majority. So it allows the government to come in with a clear agenda. They have the votes in the House of Commons to push through that agenda and it's a very easily understood system because you basically get one vote for one candidate in one writing. There's no real, real way to, to mess it up. It is as easy to understand as it could possibly be. The results are often counted quickly. Um, but the problem with the one vote for the one candidate is electors, when they're in the ballot box, with that one choice, are often having to make a choice that's divided three ways. They may uh, be looking at the strengths of the individual candidate that they're voting for. They may have thoughts about the political party and its agenda nationally. But they also might be swayed by the individual party leaders. So those three big choices, those three thoughts that you have to have, you only get one ballot to mark. So that's, that's some of the drawbacks of our system. Um, popular governments that are given new mandates under first past the post can be re-elected strongly based on uh, whether they keep in favor with the electorate, but they can also be just as quickly tossed out. When you look at the 1984 election when Brian Mulroney's Conservatives came to power tossing out the Trudeau government, that was a major sweep. It happened again in 1993 when the Liberals under Jean Chrétien, and of course in 2015 when the Liberals took out Stephen Harper's Conservative government. The other benefit too is that there is a clearly understood geographical link to your member of parliament. Every MP in those 338 seats in the House of Commons represents a distinguishable slice of Canada with borders that are clearly understood people who live in whatever neighborhood in Canada can clearly understand who their MP is and who to go for for that help. However, if we look at some of the problems with first past the post, I've identified five main ones. Um, the system is prone to producing very distorted electoral outcomes based usually on false majorities. An example in the last two elections is that 39% of the popular vote translated into 100% of the legislative power in the House of Commons. A basic minority ruling over the majority. Um, you know, majority governments are open to listening to us opposition MPs, but when it comes to crunch time and the votes are being counted, they are basically an elected dictatorship. They have the votes to push through whatever they want, and they have that uh, type of power for the full term of their mandate. Now, if you look in the 2015 election results, it took 38,000 votes to elect each Liberal MP. It took 57,000 votes to elect each Conservative, 79,000 for each NDP, 82,000 for each Bloc, and my favorite, it took 603,000 Canadians to vote one Green MP. Those are the great disparities of our system. For the Liberals, 39% of the vote resulted in 54% of the seats. The Conservatives had 31% of the vote that resulted in 29% of the seats. NDP was 19% of the vote that resulted in 13% of the seats and so on. And the Greens, of course, 3.45% of the vote that were represented in 
And there are other examples. If you go to other elections, in the 1993 election, the Conservatives captured only two seats, despite receiving 16% of the vote. In that same election, the Bloc Québécois surged to 54 seats and official opposition status with 13.5% of the vote. They captured less of the popular vote than the Conservative Party, but outnumbered them by 52 full seats. And reform, of course, re received about 51 seats in that election with less than 19% of the vote. The other aspect is lower voter turnout. 2015 was an exception, but in the last quarter century, we have seen a downward trend in the turnout of Canadians showing up to vote. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but I mean, if you just look at in six elections since the year 2000, four of them are the lowest turnout in Canadian history. That's all just since the year 2000. And we've been a country since 1867. Um, I think it contributes to sort of a, a general lack of political interest when you have so many different safe seats for parties that people who might oppose the winning candidate just don't bother to show up because they think it's a wasted vote. Um, some parties could probably run a dog in that electoral district and would still win. That's how safe those seats are. <laughs> uh, there's often pressure to vote strategically, of course, in the first-past-the-post system. And I, I'm, I'm certainly aware that we did see a lot of that in, in the 2015 election. There was very much a conserve, concerted effort to, to get rid of the conservative government, but it does force people to uh, vote for a party they may not necessarily have chosen as their first choice. The other part is the regional tensions, because our present system rewards parties that are able to bunch their votes in certain geographic areas. Um, for example, if you look at the liberal sweep of Atlantic Canada, um, in Nova Scotia, they won all 11 seats with 62% of the vote. In New Brunswick, all 10 seats with 51% of the vote. PEI, four seats with 58.3% of the vote. And in Newfoundland, all seven seats with 64.5% of the vote. So that's 32 seats total. Not one of them represented by the NDP or the Conservatives, despite strong enough showings that in a proportional system would have guaranteed a few seats for opposition members. So you're having voices that are effectively silenced. The same happens in Alberta. In Alberta in 2015, the Conservatives captured 29 out of 34 seats with 59% of the vote and 10 out of 14 seats in Saskatchewan with only 48% of the vote. So our current system rewards parties that put their eggs in one basket. It, it ends up pitting region against region, province against province, because you have regions or provinces that are represented overwhelmingly by members of parliament from one party. And I've seen it happen in my short tenure as member of parliament already. You'll have uh, and members of parliament saying, we represent this region, we talk for it, and there's this real pitting of east versus west in the House of Commons and this sort of false assumption that we speak for an entire region because the electoral map is painted all blue or it's painted all red. But the proportional votes, the percentage of votes received, tell a different story. The other thing that happens under our current system is that fewer women and fewer visible minorities are elected. Our, our current system uh, rewards party nominations of so-called safe candidates. And if you look at the current makeup of the House of Commons, there are 247 <coughs> males compared to 88 women. So it is a very disproportionate number of men compared to women and does not at all reflect what Canada's population represents. I'm happy to be in a caucus where there are 18 out of 44 who are women, but even then there's still a lot of work to be done. And I know that uh, my friend Kennedy Stewart is trying to do the best he can with the private members bill uh, to sort of bring some more balance to that. But I think if we were to, to look at some serious reform of our electoral system, that would do a good job as well. And then the last point is that lower system approval levels. I think if you look 
at the general level of satisfaction uh, that Canadians have for their electoral system and compare it to people who, who maybe enjoy a proportional representation system, there seems to be better general satisfaction for the people who are in PR systems. They, they feel that their voices are actually getting heard, that they can see the results they actually voted for, and it encourages more, uh, more working together. You know, if parties have to look at other parties not as enemies or as opponents, but as maybe a future coalition party, I think that might bring about the political change and the working together that we ultimately need to see to tackle some of our most serious problems. So just to give you a, uh, another showing, so the Broadband Institute uh, just provided this little graphic and making reference to 9 million votes that were wasted. So those are the 9 million votes that did not count towards electing a member of parliament. And as you can see, uh, equaling the three, the three middle prairie provinces and of course uh, most of the Atlantic provinces combined. So that just goes to show you, um, you know, in my election here in Couchamal at Langford, I, I got 36% of the vote. But that means a majority of people did not vote for me. And, and the same is told in writings across this country. Um, so it's ultimately about giving those people the voice that they so richly deserve and, and not having this phenomenon of so many millions of votes that are wasted that didn't really count towards anything. So the system that's going on right now um, the, the Electoral Reform Committee is a special committee that was created by the House of Commons in June, and it's thanks to the hard work of my great colleague Nathan Cullen. So um, there was a lot of back and forth uh, between the government and the opposition benches in the months leading up to June about what the exact uh, structure of this committee would be. I think the Liberals initially were favoring the standard committee structure, which would see it a 10-member committee with six Liberals, three Conservatives, and one NDP. And we were arguing that in a question as fundamental as this, you can't give yourself the false majority on the committee that you are trying to change. I and mean, it, <laughs> it just did not make sense at all. So through the hard work of my colleague Nathan Cullen, and the Liberals, to their credit, did accept it, the Special Committee on Electoral Reform is a 12-member committee made up of five Liberals, three Conservatives, two New Democrats, one Bloc, and one Green. So every party has a seat at the table, every party is represented, and more importantly, no one party can dictate what the report is going to end up as. Uh, there has to be consensus reached. And uh, that committee has been working hard over the summer. It was formed in early June with a motion that passed the House. And uh, as you can see, um, the committee right now it has been interviewing a lot of expert witnesses and receiving feedback. And of course, what I received from you tonight will be a part of that. Uh, so we have, to, we have to provide that feedback to the committee uh, by next month. They are due to produce their report to the government by December 1st. And of course, it will be publicly available for, for everyone to look at. And then uh, April 2017, that's when we've had the government promise uh, to present the legislative plan for, for what they're going to do with the committee's report. And by June uh, 2017, uh, that's when Elections Canada seriously has to start preparing for the 2019 election. So that just gives you, uh, you know, the clock really is ticking. Uh, it's, we're already less than a year away from this date. Can I ask? Question, Alistair? Sure. Is it absolutely positive that there is going to be a referendum? That's what the committee is examining. It's one of the big questions that's been deli delivered. Yeah. Thanks. Mary? Alistair? Yeah. <coughs> Has there been discussion of a constitutional reference to the Supreme Court of Canada? Uh, I would, I'm not familiar with every aspect of the witness testimony. It may have been referenced. That might have been certainly been some of the questions at the MPs. You're going to ask if another major change that was proposed in the last government 
uh, what is the change in the nature of the Canadian <coughs> Can you speak up, please? I'm sorry, my voice is, um, I'll try to speak a little more loudly. Um, my reference was to the possibility of a Supreme Court of Canada reference concerning any proposal that should come forward from the committee uh, concerning its broad constitutionality in just the same way as we addressed in the last government uh, the questions of the then Harper government's proposals uh, for Senate reform as to their constitutionality. And I was wondering if this is something that the committee has considered and um, if not, and I'm, you, I'm not sure on that particular point. Would be interested in that. Um, I'm still not clear. Thank you. No, no worries. Okay, absolutely. I can include that as a reference, and I can check with my colleagues on the committee to Thank see if so that's much. Across. Um So, and then just to sort of firm up the timeline that we're looking at for, for Elections Canada. So, as I mentioned, by fall of 2017, uh, they they need to be ready to implement any electoral reform. Um, by April of 2019, so it's the legislation basically has to be introduced in the House of Commons next spring. Uh, we're looking at, it would have to be passed before summer comes about, so that by the time fall 2017 comes around, Elections Canada clearly knows what it's working with, um, and can work to April of 2019 when they can begin informing Canadians in advance of the next election, which is slated for October of 2019. So, you know, it's it, time marches quickly in politics. Like next month is going to be one year into this new government's mandate. Uh, we're a quarter of a way there already. So um, that's the, the clock is ticking, and I think uh, everyone everyone is very cognizant of that fact. And uh, you know, we'll we'll have to see what the committee produces. So with this last slide, um, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Mark Williams, our next guest, uh, who, who as a political studies professor is going to go a little bit over some of the alternative systems. And uh, thanks, Mark, for looking forward to hearing Thank you very much, Alistair. And thank you to Jennifer and to the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this important discussion. And it is certainly a discussion that is long overdue for Canadian political culture. In a lot of ways, single member plurality made a lot of sense back in the days of Confederation and in the aftermath. Back during those days, Canadian federal elections were contested between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party, and many majority governments were backed by majority popular votes. A lot of those big wins by Sir John A. Macdonald were backed up by majority victory, so too was Alexander Mackenzie, Wilfrid Laurier. These leaders had a majority back. However, it's because you didn't have a third party or multiple parties during this period of time. Back in these early elections, less than 2% of the vote typically went to a, another party or to an individual that wasn't affiliated with one of the two big parties. However, since the end of World War I, we've seen a dramatic shift in the Canadian political landscape and the opening up to the third parties and more, with the Progressive Party, the CCF, with the NDP, the Bloc, the Greens. And since the end of World War I, we have only seen one third of our majority governments actually backed by a majority of the popular vote. We can only count it. And that's me being generous with rounding, counting up from around 49% or just under 50%. As Alistair mentioned, the last time it occurred was over 30 years ago with Brian Mulroney's Progressive Conservatives back in 1984. And only a handful of others have done it. John Ethan Baker won with a massive majority. Louis Saint Laurent was able to do it. Swing Lyon Mackenzie King was able to do it. but no one else. So this is a, an issue that has actually been under the surface of life in Canada for quite some time. What I'm going to do this evening is to talk about two of the models that are being discussed as viable alternatives to the single member plurality or first past the post system that's currently adopted alternative voting 
and then proportional <coughs> representation. And hopefully we'll be able to talk about these models and any other ones during the Q&A period. So to start off, the alternative vote is really trying to reform our current system. So we keep basically the same number of ridings, the 338 ridings that we now have in the country, and you try to turn it into first past the post. Political scientists don't actually like calling our electoral system first past the post because there really is no post. It's just about finishing uh, the race ahead of your opponents, not actually crossing a predetermined finish line. You just have to get more votes than anyone else that you're up against in that riding. Whereas first past the post makes you think that, well, the post should obviously be a majority, that you want to have at least 50%. With this system, under the first count, you can win in the riding and not actually have more than 50% of the votes. In fact, on the first count, you might not even finish in first place. With the alternative vote, you go to the polls and you see the ballots, and it's very, be very similar to the ballots as they are now where you see a list of candidates and the parties that they represent, and instead of simply marking your choice, you're actually going to assign a rank to them, either ranking them all or at least ranking two, ranking a first choice and then a second choice. So what is done is that all of the first votes are counted up, and if nobody actually has a majority of the vote on that first count, then what was typically done is that they go to the candidate, the first choice candidate, who garnered the fewest number of votes. So for instance, here in Couch and Valley, would be the Marxist-Leninist party. And so they would look at all of those ballots that selected the Marxist-Leninist party as their number one choice, and they go and they count up, not those ballots, because the counts for Marxist-Leninists don't have any bearing, but they count up the second choice candidate from those ballots. Add that to the total and see if anyone has hit the benchmark at 50%. Very few votes typically find their way to Marxist-Leninist candidates, and so they go to the next uh, lowest candidate on the list. So the Green Party, which here on, on Vancouver Island typically is actually quite high, around 20% for us. And so then they count up the second choice preferences for the Green Party and see if someone actually gains 50% of the vote through that methodology. And so it's very much uh, it's a reform of the system, but it's certainly not a, a revolution of the system because it largely keeps the same kind of structures in place, but it just asks you, while you're casting your vote, to have a ranked order. And the idea of that is that fewer votes are wasted. So if your first choice person may not get elected, well, at least you can perhaps play a role in electing someone else with your second choice candidate. Another model, one that would entail far more sweeping changes for Canada is proportional representation. And under this model, every vote is going to be counted. And you get 30% of the votes, the party gets 30% of the votes nationally, they get 30% of the seats in the House of Commons. They send 30 individuals to Parliament. So if you get 30% of the vote, you're going to win just over 100 seats in a 338 seat House of Commons. It's seen as much more fair than many other models because all votes are going to count. You never really have the feeling of wasting your vote. And it's simply seen as much more accurate as well. Something, it's a system that reflects the national mood much more effectively, and it really cuts down on the number of majority governments. What emerges from systems based of, on proportional representation <coughs> is 
minority governments that are actually coalition governments, which would be quite revolutionary for Canada, which is a country that has not had much experience with coalition governments. It is not since the Unionist uh, Party, which included the Conservatives and Liberals who were in favor of conscription during World War I, have we ever had a true coalition type of government form. And in fact, Canadian reaction to the talk of coalition government in the aftermath of the 2008 election was something that was really quite mixed, where there were certainly some Canadians that were vocal supporters of the idea of a coalition government, primarily between the Liberals and the NDP, with the Bloc agreeing not to interfere with legislation as long as they felt it didn't harm Quebec sovereignty. Canadian opinion seemed to have a bit of a pushback against that. And I'm not sure if that's really because of the convention against coalition governments in Canadian politics, or if that is more a product of its time in 2008, where the Liberals faced such a crushing victory, uh, loss, sorry, a crushing loss at, under the leadership of Stéphane Dion, who had just before that talked about leaving the uh, leadership role of the Liberal Party and hearing that, and then all of a sudden hearing this guy say he wants to be the Prime Minister of Canada, that probably had a a very high weight on the public mood of the time. So the Broadbent Institute had put together a graphic to show you what the House of Commons would actually look like if the results of the 2015 election were based on a proportional system. And what you would see is that the Liberals would not have actually won a majority government. They certainly would have the most votes still, but certainly not a majority, they would lose a lot of votes and that holds up for just about any election in Canadian history, at least since around World War I, where <clears throat> the majority government is turned into a minority government, just a handful of exceptions. The Conservatives would actually have won a few more seats, the NDP certainly would have won quite a few more seats, the bloc in this situation would have won more, whereas Alistair pointed out there's a lot of other occasions in Canadian politics where the bloc would actually have won far fewer seats than they did, and the Greens would have done much, much better, an increase of 10 seats. However, this is all predicated on the system that we currently employ, first past the post, single member plurality. If Canadians were in an election where they understood that it was proportional representation, what would these numbers look like? It could actually look really quite different and the face of Canadian politics can change because the strategic voting, as Alistair mentioned, won't really have that same kind of an effect. And presumably some of you here, I know myself for instance, I have not always voted for the party or the person that in my heart I wanted to vote for. Instead, I perhaps voted in a way as to prevent someone else or another party from winning an extra seat in the House of Commons. With proportional representation, you don't have those same kinds of questions in your mind. You vote for your party. Some of the benefits of proportional representation based on a comparative study of OECD countries, so those advanced liberal democracies of North America, Europe, and a handful of countries in East Asia, like Japan, you see more women get elected under proportional representation. Under proportional representation, you need to have parties write a party list, because for most models, you're not going there and necessarily voting for an individual, for a person. You're voting for that party. So before the election, each party is going to publicly disclose the list, a ranked list of all of the people who will represent the party in the parliament, in the House of Commons. And under a proportional system, parties are typically much more mindful of having what is more closely resembling gender parity. So basically more women get put on that list. A lot of parties in Canada uh, do in fact run women as their candidates, but quite often it really is just there for the claim of gender parity where a lot of women are put into ridings 
where they don't have a really strong shot of actually winning. So they're parachuted in to say that, look, we stand for gender parity. With a party list, though, it's very clear whether or not a party believes in that principle. And you can tell whether they actually have a number of women candidates high up on that list. Another interesting revelation of proportional representation is that these countries typically have much greater equality, income equality within their societies compared to countries that employ the single member plurality. Countries that employ SNP include, of course, Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, at least at the national level. And these are countries that also have a great disparity between the rich and the rest of society, especially when we start looking at the relationship, the ratio of the total value of wealth versus the total national income. So the amount of capital or wealth in a country versus the income that people actually take home. In proportional representation systems in places found in Scandinavia, in Germany, in East Asian countries like Japan, we see not as wide of a gap between what the top 1% takes home versus the rest of the country. It's typically an engaging system too. As Alistair mentioned, there is much higher levels of satisfaction, at least in the electoral system found in proportional representation. And it does improve voter turnout. In some cases, really quite high, going up to around 10%, which I think for the status of democracy here in Canada and across the Western world, having voter turnout plunge to close to 50% is not a good development for uh, democracy in Canada. And it is especially not a good development when youth voter apathy can be so high. Under proportional representation, people know that their vote doesn't matter. Very briefly, just to conclude then, I thought there might be a few questions you might have about why you might not want to necessarily support proportional representation and give my thoughts on them. First of all, you lose your ability to vote for individuals and you lose your ability to be represented by individuals in your writing. And I think that, at least my response to that, is that there is a certain kind of truth because parties are going to be writing these party lists themselves. There's a danger that they're going to really be privileging the core, so the dense urban centers of Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. There's certainly that concern. But if a party was to do that, was to play that kind of a game, then it would have to be punished by the media and by voters and by democratic forums. And it would not serve their interests to take such a strategy. My, another point on this is that while some Canadians do vote for people, for individuals, because they believe that they represent, will represent the riding and the local issues, or because they believe in the moral character of those who are competing in the, the riding, I'm sure many people voted for the Honourable Alistair McGregor because they generally do, sincerely do, like him and believe him to be this very moral guardian of, of the people of Couch and Valley. Most people vote for the party anyway. Or if they're voting for a person, they're voting for the party leader. And so under a proportional system, that's what you're doing. You're voting for the party, and you are primarily, if you're voting for anyone, you're probably going to be voting for the leader uh, of that party more than anything. My other point on this concern about losing representation is that proportional representation is not a zero-sum game. There are many systems that actually combine single-member plurality with proportional representation. And it's called a, a mixed-member plurality because it's mixed between first-past-the-post and proportional. And I think that the countries that employ proportional representation that Canada could learn the most from are those kinds of countries, like Germany, for instance. <coughs> Germany is un almost unique, like Canada, 
because it's a federal state. Sovereignty is shared between a central government and government at a subnational level. Provinces here. No, not many countries are actually like that. The United States is like that. Germany, as I mentioned, Russia, India, just a handful. Big, diverse <coughs> countries uh, require that. And so what Germany has done <coughs> since unification is to split the parliament, the Bundestag, into half the seats being awarded based on first past the post and the other half based on proportional representation as a way to balance between the two. And the German model has been one of incredible stability for proportional representation. I think a lot of people might look at proportional representation and they might look at the more dysfunctional examples like Belgium. Belgium, of course, has the notorious record of going the longest amount of time without actually having government. And proportional representation has really played into those deep-rooted cleavages that exist in Belgium. Cleavages that, in fact, do have a certain resonance for Canada, such as the cleavage between the Flemish and the Walloon is in some ways comparable to the Francophone and Anglophone <coughs> solitude that exists in Canada. But there are more examples of political stability than the instability of Belgium, especially those that try to employ a mix of proportional representation with the current system. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pause there and then I'll turn the floor over to our, our next speaker. Can I ask you a question? question? Yeah. Oh, sure. On your graphic, uh, originally um, going back uh, on how the vote distribution would have changed, I was just wondering what were the riding sizes uh, in that? In, in, like, was that for the whole country or? Oh, that is taking a look at the popular vote across the country. So, so that just was the nation as a whole, as opposed it is, to individual riding. Or yeah, it, okay. it just gets rid of individual riding. Some forms of proportional representation actually keep individual ridings, and they just make the ridings really big, and so they have lots of seats up for grab. So Norway does this, and so in Norway, it's proportional representation, but you have all these different constituents that are their own battleground with a bunch of different seats up for grabs. So Oslo has the most seats up for grabs, and something like just under 20 seats, and those seats can be spread out across a number of different parties depending on that popular vote house. So if I'm understanding you correctly, then Vancouver Island, for example, would become one riding and we would elect uh, that five or seven APs, I can't remember how many we have now. So. Yeah, that, that's one way of doing it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, there's obviously no perfect political system, and I really appreciate giving this presentation. Um, in the PR system, there has been a lot of failures, like really profound ones. Could you tell us about the worst failure for me of the PR system was uh, the fall of the Weimar government? Yes, um, absolutely. Perhaps you could share that, because that is an implication to this in coalition governments. Absolutely, yeah. When faced with economic catastrophe and ruination at the end of World War I, the Weimar Republic really floundered as a proportional system. And I guess one of the legacies, though, about why Germany has been so stable after unification is that it's not stable by law, but it's stable by convention, because if there is if the chancellor loses a vote of confidence in the Bundestag, then an election is triggered. If that doesn't happen, then an election happens every four years. And so really it's the experiences of the Weimar Republic where you have election after election pretty much every year, sometimes much less than a year. Uh, you, you then have I know all these elections, total instability, and then looking <coughs> to an ideology like fascism, which promises strength and unity. And I think that's why Germany has just had this convention of not trying to cause a loss of confidence. In fact, since unification, the only time the Germans went to the polls before they naturally would after the four-year period is just once. And it was after three years, so it wasn't even that long. So I think that's really shaped German politics today. And perhaps Canada could, in fact, experience, it could, they could have multiple elections triggered under a coalition system, under proportional representation. It's entirely plausible. 
but it was the coalitions which led to the eventual demise of the government, the coalitions yeah. with the Nazis, Before right, to maintain the government. The, uh, speaker repeat the question, because I can't hear. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. And, and we, we have uh, got some time in this presentation for questions and answers, um, so I, I just, if, before if we I, if I could just make one comment on Germany. Sure. Um, it's been about 70 years that the Germans been after the Second World War that they've been involved with the proportional representation with the 50-50 system. And, uh, but they have it so the only parties that get 5% or more of the votes uh, actually are divided. So during this past election, they had 19 parties running who did not actually get any uh, seats because of that. Yeah. So what happens is with proportional representation, it spawns all kinds of parties because you don't have that same decision to make about what you want to support. And so actually how it turned out in Germany, there's been 18 elections and four-year terms, and 15 of those elections have been won by the uh, Christian Democratic Party paired up with the Christian Science Party from Bavaria. Right. So uh, Christian, uh, the Christian Democrats got 40% of the vote this last time. The Bavarian <coughs> Party got 8.9. So there's your 48.9% and that performs the core of their coalition. And actually, if you think about it, over the 70 years, 60 of those years has been that same coalition. Yeah. So if we would interpret that into Canada, I could very easily visualize that we would have a liberal party always get a, a leading number of votes, such as you see on the board. <coughs> and maybe the Bloc Quebecois would be the regional party, like the Bavarian party, they could join up with them and they could become our government for the next 60 years. And, and so I don't think we want to go to that kind of a system in Canada. It's possible. I mean, I think the Liberals, get, they've been shellacked a few times. Okay. Now in Norway, with Norway, they have those 19 counties. Yeah. And as you say, Oslo has 19, but they only have one uh, proportion of representation per county. So a lot of... Yeah. 161 seats, they only have 19 <coughs> seats that are actually proportioned. So there's all kinds of variations of what you might do. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Terry now, and uh, there will be room for questions and comments uh, at, at the end of the presentation. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack. I'm going to speak more personally about why I champion electoral reform, and then I'm going to give some, just a few highlights from Fair Vote Canada's submission to this parliamentary committee. And just in case you don't know, Fair Vote Canada is a national organization, 99% volunteer driven, 66,000 members, 40 chapters and teams across Canada. And I'm not a staff member, I'm a volunteer. <laughs> Um, and I just, my first disclaimer is that I'm not an expert um, like Mark and Alistair, um, but I am an ordinary citizen and proud of it. And I'm a woman and I'm an environmentalist <coughs> and I'm someone who really cares deeply about democracy and civil discourse in our country. How many of you could relate to one of those labels? Right. <laughs> so I'm not alone. And believe me, as I started to delve into all these different systems, my eyes just glazed over. <coughs> but I kind of feel I've come down to earth now, and I'll explain why. I grew up in the 60s in Ontario, and I was involved in the movements for peace, for <coughs> women's rights, and racial equality, as I'm sure some of you were, judging from some gray hairs. And eventually, though, I had to earn a living. So I ended up in the public sector as an adult educator and became finally, at the end of my career, the vice president academic of Fleming College in Peterborough. And because I was in the public sector, I couldn't be involved in official politics. And in fact, after my 60s activism, I became quite cynical. And for a long time, I was disengaged. <coughs> Since I moved to, Vic uh, to Victoria 10 years ago with my husband, though, and I'm retired, life has returned. I can be active. And so my political uh, interests have been re reborn. I don't always 
vote by for the same party. I vote for the best candidate. And I voted strategically in the last election uh, in, a, in order to ensure that the, the government that was in power then was not re-elected. But I don't feel comfortable doing that. I don't want to have to vote strategically. And as Alistair said, I mean, I was shocked to realize that 9 million votes in our last election resulted in those 9 million votes not having a voice in Parliament to represent their interests. And those are conservative interests, liberal interests, NDP, Green. You know, it affects all of us, regardless of party. The only thing that I was happy, though, is that 63% of voters in that election chose parties that were campaigning on making 2019 the last election under first past the post. So that encouraged me. And that's why I got involved with Fair Vote Canada. The, the then <coughs> leader in the Capital Region, is, some of you may know her, Wendy Bergeron. Anybody know her? She, she asked me to get involved. She's, she died in March, and she has called on all of us to pick up the, the baton and carry it on for her. So I want to give you my three reasons for why I wake up at night, and I do wake up at night, <laughs> fretting about electoral reform. And the first reason is climate change. Um, I really, and not all of you, we may not all be on the same wavelength here, but I feel that fossil fuel expansion and one and a half degrees limit on global warming don't mix. It's like oil and water. And in fact, Canada has regularly been rated by the OECD as at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to climate performance. And what bugs me and how this relates to electoral reform is that I feel we're constantly playing jack-in-the-box. Does anybody here remember that game as a kid? Constantly, the, the puppet would spring up and you bang the lid down. First we have Enbridge popping up and we slam the lid, or we hope we have. Kinder Morgan pops up. BC's mayors come out and officially slam the lid on that, along with two-thirds of BC citizens in polls have, have recorded their opposition. But who's listening? Then the LNG proposals start mushrooming in BC, and we have one right now in our backyard in the Saanich Inlet. And we mobilize again, or some of us do, to slam that lid. The Site C dam has popped up a while ago, and it's something that I really care passionately about because if it proceeds, taxpayers' dollars, nine billion dollars worth, that's what it's going to mean for us, at least, at minimum. Farmland that could feed a million people will be flooded, and First Nations rights infringed again. And so all of these struggles, you know, you just, it gets you tired, it gets you dizzy. It's like a merry-go-round of constant challenges to our planet. And I am convinced that we can't stop floods and droughts and fracking-induced earthquakes with our current first-past-the-post system, where a majority of people's wishes are not represented in the House. I, I want to note that the Liberal government certainly has a better stance on climate change than the previous government, but we're still at risk in terms of that actually being carried out. So what, go, what helps me go to sleep? I told you I wake up at night worried. In all the work in the last year or so that I've been doing, the reading I've been doing, it, very encouraged to hear that 90 countries around the world have a better record on climate change than we do. And why? In large part because they use a form of proportional representation in their national assemblies. And it's no accident that those 90 countries are responsible for a shrinking share of carbon emissions in the world. And Yale University has rated them six points higher on their environmental performance index. And I believe that if we had a system of governance like they do, that truly represents all of our collective voices, we would have a democratic legal way to curb 
oil and gas interests to at least make sure that other voices are at the table. So I'm looking for a long-term solution. I'm tired of constantly having to respond to these different climate challenges. I say it's time for Jack to stay in the box. <laughs> Once and for all. Secondly, as a woman, I mean, Alistair, both Alistair and Mark pointed this out, but it really upsets me. 26% of our parliamentarians are women. And Canada is 54, is ranked 54 in the world, well behind countries like Angola, Belarus, Iraq, South Sudan, and Afghanistan. Yeah. I mean, that is shocking. And, and, you know, as I witnessed the last federal election and saw so many women gear up and get in there and fight, you know, to, to win a nomination and to go to battle and only to lose, it just really, really disheartened me. But I sleep better at night because I know from the work, the research that I've done and some of the witnesses that I've been listening to at the committee hearings, women fare better. And it's a, an objective truth in countries using a form of PR. And they're not penalized for running for a smaller party, which many women feel more comfortable in doing. I love the fact that Dr. Joanna Everett, who's the Dean of Arts at the University of New Brunswick, she says that if Canada switched to a proportional system, our percentage of women MPs would go up by 10% in the next election. Whereas, if we stick with what we've got, it will take 100 years to get gender parity. And I don't know about you, but I'm not waiting 100 years. Um, under the first past the post system, the, the reason why that's a problem is because you've only got one person to choose from in each writing. And that person, sorry Alistair, tends to be white and male. <laughs> At least he's young. At least he's young. <laughs> and that is supportive. <laughs> but other PR, what I like is the fact you can have multiple candidates in a district working as a team with an open list ballot. So it's in the interest of parties to put forward multiple diverse candidates and particularly women. And the other nice thing that I like about PR is that it involves more consensus building and compromise, qualities that women, I think, relate to better than the kind of aggressive one-upmanship of first past the post. We prefer to give and take, not take all. And lastly, I'm a woman of faith and hope. And not just because I'm a member of the Squamalt United Church and a Buddhist son. Um, I'm drawn to a positive vision of the future, not a culture of fear. And when I listen, I mean, I find it so hard, as I'm sure you do, to US news. <laughs> but they have a system not identical to ours, but it's first past the post. And you look at the polarization that is going on in that country. And we saw echoes of it in Canada in the last election and in Toronto. Fortunately, we voted against that. Fear, in my mind, is a terrible motivator. And what's been encouraging me lately is watching, I've been watching on CPAC, the live hearings of this committee. I've watched nearly 20 out of the 23, and I have come away feeling, wow, there's hope. And they've encouraged us to tweet, so I've been tweeting. Like, I, I've been part of that process. I've been between Nathan Cullen and Elizabeth May, and, and they pick up on the public's tweets. And what has impressed me is I've heard 50 witnesses from all countries all over the world, you know, who know what they're talking about, and give in-depth presentations. And the response of this all-party committee has been friendly, and it's been constructive, <coughs> and there's been a really good discussion. So that gives me hope. And I'm also hopeful, as I've heard as part of these hearings, the results of the fact that Canada has had 13 separate electoral reform processes. 13. Many of them citizen-led. 
and at both the national level and the provincial level, including BC, Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, Manitoba, and PEI this October. So surely we can say yes to what they have all recommended. All those citizens' assemblies and law commissions, they all recommended we move away from first past the post, join the rest of the democratic world, and adopt some form of proportionality. And I think we've done our homework and we don't need a referendum. I know that's controversial. We'll have a debate. <laughs> so just to close, I just want to note that um, Fairville uh, has um, <coughs> adheres and respects the five principles that our Minister of Democratic Reform, Marianne Monset, has put forward. And those are, just so you know, that the system, whatever system we have, must be effective and legitimate must engage voters, must be accessible and inclusive, has integrity, and guarantees local representation. And we agree with that. We're nonpartisan, um, but we do believe that it's quite possible that we're going to have to rank our priorities. Like, you can't get all of those values equally <coughs> adhered to in every single voting system. And for me, what's at the top of my list are legitimacy, inclusiveness, and local representation. And I would encourage you to think about, when you look at those five values, what's, what's close to the top of your list? Another question people have asked us is, do we support one model of PR? We don't. I'll say it outright. Even though it's tempting, we don't. We're really clear that it's important to, to present a variety of models. And so in our submission and on our table there, you'll see we've submitted three models. The first one being mixed member proportional that Mark was talking about that was recommended by the Law Commission of Canada in 2004 and the NDP and is used in many jurisdictions. The second model is called Single Transferable Vote, or STV, which many of you are familiar with because it's what our BC Citizens Assembly recommended. And the third model is a hybrid. And this is a new model, so I urge you to take a look at it, called Rural Urban Proportional. <coughs> and it combines elements of MMP and STV. It's trying to take into account the needs of the rural ridings with the urban and ensure a degree of proportionality. So I'm encouraged by the fact that I think we, could, we can have a form of PR that's made in Canada. We don't have to follow another country's exact model. And I was sort of intrigued to realize that Winnipeg, Calgary, and Edmonton both use, or all three of them, used a form of single transferable vote from the 1920s to the 50s. I mean, did you know that? I didn't know that. So we have some experience with this. Our bottom line, however, is that we must choose a proportional system. Using ranked ballots, as Mark showed a minute ago, um, called alternative vote, in a single member district is not good enough. Why? Because, for me anyway, I don't want to have my second and third or third best choice. I want to have my first choice. I want to have that voice there. So I don't think that's good enough. And AV can lead to big centrist parties getting the, getting the support at the expense of smaller parties. I trust the parliamentary committee. I really do. Uh, and I trust that they're listening to the experts. They're listening to the people through forums like this, through the history of all of our consultations and that they will propose a sensible solution to Parliament this fall. So I thank you. I urge you to come out. The committee's coming to Victoria on Tuesday, September 27th, in the afternoon and the evening. The evening will be an open mic, and we want as many people there as possible to, to get up there and say, say your piece. We'll have a rally just before with Nathan Cullen, Elizabeth May, uh, who else, Rick? Nathan Cullen, Elizabeth May, David Murder, and Guy Donson. So they'll be speaking. So we hope you can come and do sign our petition 
to make sure that every vote counts. Thank you. We're just going to get this back up for you. What day do you say that will again? Uh, Tuesday, September 27th. And uh, the evening session will probably start around 6. And if it's anything like the Kinder Morgan hearing, you want to get there early and sign up soon. Where is it? They haven't told us yet, but it will be announced soon. And I'm sure Alistair will make sure you all know. Okay, um, so while Jennifer uh, tries to find the outlet up here, um, the next part of our presentation that I wanted to talk about was to, uh, to give a, a small plug for a private member's bill that I sponsored. So I wanted to talk to you about uh, Bill C-279, which I introduced um, during the, uh, the previous session. Okay, it's here. So uh, it was on uh, May, May 31st of uh, this year that I introduced Bill C-279. And uh, as many of you are aware, our, um, our election uh, last year was the second longest in Canadian history at 78 days. And I know a lot of you in this room were volunteers uh, for the many political parties that uh, contested that. And I know uh, Martin up there uh, certainly shares <laughs> this is a sympathetic ear because as a fellow candidate, uh, he had to go through it. But it was an exhausting campaign, uh, starting on August 2nd and going all the way to October 19th. And you know, I uh, during the course of the campaign, um, uh, one of the, the frequent questions that I came across on the doorsteps was, why are we having such a long campaign? Why do we need 78 days to choose a new government? And so that kind of stayed around with me. So, so in the early months of going to Parliament, I was sort of percolating on it, just tossing it around my head. And I, I examined the Canada Elections Act, and I found that elections have to be a minimum of 36 days, but there is no maximum. So theoretically, a government could call an election period that could be six months long. There's nothing to stop them. And there was a, there was a little known uh, loophole in the uh, 2012 Fair Elections Act, which allowed uh, campaigns' budgets to increase by every day that it went, the campaign went over 37 days. So, so for example, um, we had, um, so for every day that a campaign exceeded 37 days would translate to an extra $675,000 per day for, a, par for a, a party's national campaign, an additional $2,700 per day for local candidates. Now, in 2011, political parties were capped at $21 million, but because of the length of the electoral period in 2015, that shot up to $55 million. So it, I, I saw a trend uh, towards big money entering our politics to um, vastly outspending smaller parties to basically flooding our airwaves, our TVs with nonstop political advertising. And by allowing this sort of unregulated spending just because of how long an election period is, it gives a very distinct advantage to parties with deep pockets and it silences a lot of the smaller voices out. And, and I was very concerned about that trend. But I was also concerned about the cost to taxpayers. Because Elections Canada, in order to run a 78-day campaign, uh, billed taxpayers $443 million, which was $150 million more than in 2011. And there's the additional cost of the, uh, the rebates that political parties get because they get some of their expenses subsidized by the taxpayer. So there's a number of ways here which we are all on the hook. We don't need a 78-day campaign to make our decision. We could save taxpayers money. And I think that uh, allowing big money to, to have that more of a voice in our Canadian political uh, dialogue does a disservice. So I introduced a bill uh, which basically uh, is going to cap elections at a maximum of uh, 46 days. 
Uh, so it, it gives governments a, a range of days, between 36 and 46 days. It gives them that flexibility in case the writ period happens to fall on a holiday. So there's that flexibility. But um, that's the bill that I've introduced in the House of Commons, uh, making its way uh, I think my debate spot won't come up until 2018, but that's, <laughs> that's the luck of the draw I got. And um, I, I will be uh, sending a submission to the Special Committee on Electoral Reform, uh, just championing this bill. And uh, if you think this bill is a good idea, if you'd like to see the end of long electoral periods, I certainly appreciate your support in making the government aware of it. So, uh, yes, Mark. Yeah, I fundamentally agree with you. However, there is a monumental spending by third parties, mm -hmm. and shortening the election will allow unrestrained spending by big money. And without somehow controlling that, it's kind of pointless to make elections shorter. And I'm happy to entertain amendments to that effect as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Hi. Um, as I mentioned to you, I'm a Democratic reform critic and what kind of local reform. Dr. So as I mentioned to uh, Alistair earlier uh, this evening, uh, I'm a Democratic reform critic and uh, electoral reform spokesperson for the Progressive Canadian Party uh, in this process. Uh, I also sit on the OGI steering committee for Elections Canada, and one of the proposals that, that uh, we recommended to the Chief Electoral Officer for this election and so we adopt, in, in, with a view to what you're talking about, uh, a proposal that we adopt something rather like what they do in the UK, where their equivalent of Elections Canada monitors and uh, regulates the amounts of both writ and pre-writ expenditures. The result being that they can prevent this third party input of money and making money more important than democracy. And I would, as you're developing your amendment, uh, perhaps you might want to give some thought to that, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But yeah, I mean, I'm more happy if the bill can make it past second reading and get to committee. That's where I'd love to, to see the. Well, I applaud your proposal. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think that um, that wraps up uh, the main part of our uh, presentation tonight. Um, you, as I mentioned in my intro, um, we do have some uh, some handouts there that we would love to hear your feedback. But you know, based on what you've heard tonight and uh, we've heard in the news, uh, some of your personal research, these are some of the questions uh, that we want you to be guided by as you as you decide what system you think would be best for Canada. And um, as I said, the, the main purpose of tonight is to be an informative session. But more importantly, it, it's a chance for me as your elected representative to take your feedback to the Electoral Reform Committee. So I, it's your feedback that I want to compile in the report, and I will do my, uh, my, my duty and, and submit it to the committee uh, before the deadline uh, in October next month. And, and now we have a chance for questions. And so Martin, I did see your question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and you can direct so just uh, you can direct questions to to any okay. any of the panelists up here if you wish. Uh, thank you for coming on, every you guys. It's great. Uh, little disclosure: I was the candidate for the Conservative Party in the last election. Ironically, I would have benefited from higher proportional representation, or perhaps by a rank ballot. Um, the whole process is a major concern to me. I feel like there's a possibility that certain parties are gerrymandering the system. I think without a definitive um, commitment to a referendum, the whole process should be in question. Um, every voting system has its positives and its negatives. And I'm concerned that we're not getting the full picture. Like, I didn't hear anything about rank out, but I did come a bit late. Um, we didn't hear any of the positives about first pass the post. Because in reality, Canada, in my opinion, is the second most successful democracy in the history of the world after Switzerland. And we are asking to disrupt probably the most popular, most successful democracy ever. Successful <laughs> I also am concerned that these, these uh, meetings are very partisan oriented. Everybody should have a chance to talk equally and give their opinions. And we should have, all of these formats should have somebody, a proponent of first past the post, to argue that system as well and to argue for a referendum. 
Um, you know, and write ballots, like we never really talked about it. But BC is okay. Did anybody talk about? Did anybody talk about the BC experience with ranked ballot, the social credit system? Ranked ballots, and we talked about first past. But we talked about the negative, about the. And, and, and Martin, I did talk about some of the strengths of the current system. How you know it does favor the installation of majority governments who can bring about their legislative agenda quite easily. Uh, it's an easily understood system. You know, one vote for one candidate. But did you talk about the uh, social? Credit, election of the social credit in BC? No, I didn't. I've been sticking to the federal examples. Yeah, um, that's an example of a real failure of ranked ballots, and I think it's something that everybody should know about. Not a fair analogy. Okay. It was a ranked ballot. Yeah. Um, so it is a fair analogy. Okay. And I want to be on record to go back that without a referendum and without proper uh, um, representation of all the systems, both positive and negatives, and probably more of a debate. Uh, we can't be sure that as the, the public that we're getting the full story and that we will be able to make the correct decision. Sure. So, and that's a great segue to what I'd like to say next because my uh, friend and colleague Nathan uh, Collin, who is our Democratic Reform Committee, has actually uh, proposed a referendum, but with a caveat. He would like to see a referendum after we try a new voting system because often when we have a referendum and people are not sure of new systems, they've never tried them out, and there's a lot of campaigns of misinformation that happen, people tend to fall back to the status quo. So there's no reason why we can't rewrite the legislation with some sort of a sunset clause that compels any new government voted under a new system in 2019 to then hold a referendum in its new term, and then citizens of Canada can make a decision. Was that last election fairly run? Did I enjoy the system? Was it easy to understand? Or should we go back to first past the post? So that's that's something that Nathan has suggested. Um, the, the, committee, the committee again has heard a lot of suggestions. The committee's heard a lot of suggestions in that regard. And I don't want to presuppose or prejudge what their report is going to include. But there certainly have been a lot of people bringing forth that viewpoint. And we'll have to see what their final report of December the 1st recommends. Uh, well, I, I'm kind of curious because when you say uh, we, we're supposed to give feedback on what system we'd like, are you just saying the difference between first past the post and proportional and rent? Or are you talking about things like the uh, rural urban, the, the MMP, and the single transfer level? Because that would need a bit more. Yes, I, I mean, I'm willing to accept feedback in whichever way uh, suits members of the audience here, uh, whether it's those, those forms that I've left out on your desk, that's just sort of one template that I wanted to, to sort of narrow down what is essentially a very complex question, but I am also receiving uh, written uh, comments as well. So, so, sorry, so the answer is, so the forms on the desk, which I haven't seen, you're just asking for the overall uh, one, two, three. Yeah. First past the post rank or proportion. No, no, there's, yeah, I think your neighbor might have. Oh, so, yeah. so there needs to be a bit more information, I guess, on the actual breakdown of the possible proportional representation. Oh, sure. I mean, it's a very complex yeah. subject, and proportional representation exists in many different forms. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, yes, Karen. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, um, I know uh, that before the election that the NDP was talking about uh, proportional representation and they were talking that, uh, that they thought that mixed member proportional uh, representation would be a good way to go. Um, I actually did, uh, was quite enamored of the STD or STD plus system. And the reason why is because I think uh, um, citizens themselves have more say over who gets put onto the ballot. Like I really am not at all in favor of having parties put forward their representatives. I think the system that we have now is we have a constituency and and members of the constituency put forward their candidate. And I think if we had um, a, a proportional system where you had, uh, uh, if we did have regional uh, reps, that there should be a regional constituency. So I'm not at all in favor of the party putting forward their own members. I think that should come from the grassroots. Yeah, yeah. And 
you know, even in those those lists, like there could be ways to transform what is a closed list to an open list, and maybe have a way uh, for the public to select who gets to go on those lists, um, and, and leave it up to the public to to basically rank which person among that list uh, they ultimately want to see. Um, but I do agree that any system we pick does have to have some form of regional representation. I know that people really like to uh, understand which MP represents them geographically, um, but uh, I think our, proportionally our national system does need to have work, and, and that's where the list can, can, can help. But yeah, no, I've read some good things about the STD system as well. Um, I think it's been mentioned a few times, every system has its pros and cons, and, and this committee's work, it's not an easy subject to tackle, for sure. Yes, please. Uh, I think Australia has tried the uh, regional portion, and uh, one of the drawbacks is that the party themselves can choose the candidates. I am definitely opposed to that. I think we should preserve a parliament in which people who are elected represent constituencies. Mm -hmm. and therefore, I would like to see parties uh, that have to respond to the popular vote that each candidate receives mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the constituency in which they run. So at least we have people who are uh, representing representation by population, <coughs> at least partially. I think uh, the last two points about the party selecting the candidates to me is one of the biggest rubs with the uh, proportional system. And uh, when you come right down to it, uh, like in our own writing here, we had seven candidates uh, for an injury that you won, you won the, the most votes. Mm -hmm. So even from your own description, when you take all the pluses and minuses of all these things, what's wrong with a system whereby the, the constituents pick their candidates? You vote within a constituency, and that is your member of parliament. So you have that responsibility to act federally and also locally. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, it's called the first past the post, but then in reality, it's not. It's just if you had only two candidates, <coughs> then we would have clearly a majority, majority winner, as was described earlier on. But when you've got seven candidates, uh, what you're saying is that if you get 40% of the vote, or 36, or whatever it might be, that somehow all the other votes are wasted. In my view, it, that's a situation where the majority of people in the district picked you. And so I don't think that's a bad system. So when we boil all these things down, I think we'll come right back that we shouldn't change the system very much. OK, but I mean, what about the 603,000 Canadians who voted green and got Elizabeth May as their single one? OK, good. So it just so happened in all of those districts, uh, there was because you, know, you have to look at the number of voters in districts and all that kind of stuff. So at that end of the day, she still got, what, 3.24% of the total vote? Well, if you'd used the German system, it wouldn't have met that five benchmark. She wouldn't have got any anyway. Sure. So the reality is that, uh, you know, there, there's no system to, that's ever <coughs> going to make that any better or worse. It's just the way it is under democracy. Um, you alluded to this at the beginning, and I just want to make sure I have this correct. Um, it seems to me that the changing the system of voting federally does not require a constitutional amendment. No, no okay. it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. Uh, John. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Nathan Collins uh, idea of voting on the system after a trial period yes. of the new system. <laughs> Uh, is it possible that we could have Nathan Collins actually come here and talk to us about his idea? I uh, tried that, but he is in high demand, believe it or not. And, uh, every other writing got him first. So, no, I'm unable to get him. The next time you'll have the chance to see him is uh, when he's in Victoria as part of the committee when they're visiting on the 27th. And he will be speaking Murray, at the round. Murray Rankin and uh, my colleague Sheila Malcolmson managed to get up. So. <laughs> uh, uh, Mark mentioned the correlation between uh, countries in which there is a fair bit of income disparity and also countries in those same countries tending to use the first past post system. And we also talked a little bit about 
uh, campaign financing and the influence of uh, big and especially single source money and that sort of thing. Um, are any of the electoral systems more or less susceptible to that sort of financial influence? Uh, you know, the various flavors of uh, proportional representation and so on. So one of the things that influenced me was, would be the knowledge of such a thing exists that one uh, aspect of proportional representation is better able to withstand that sort of influence? Um, I, I think the big difference pertains to lobbying that exists in single member plurality systems versus corporatism and neo-corporatism of the social democracies and disproportional representation. And uh, that emerges from, I think, the experiences of social democracy in the Scandinavian countries and in, in Germany, where you do have labor at the negotiating table, and you do have people representing labor, whereas influence in Washington and in Ottawa is, I think, disproportionately influenced by private interests over the concerns of labor, for instance. And so it's one of the big reasons why you have countries like Germany and Sweden and Norway maintain their progressive tax codes from the period after World War II, whereas in the United States, in Canada, France, the UK, you've seen that come under policy assaults. And in some ways, you, even, you almost have a regressive tax system when you factor in the minimal tax paid on capital gains, for instance. A lot of those countries that use portion representation, they also generally maintain a fairly high corporate tax rate. Of course, the US is a big exception to that because their corporate tax rate is so high in some other countries. Uh, but you know, Canada's corporate tax rate is really, really quite low compared to some other countries. It's about the same as Germany, but especially has made a big impact on income tax rates for the, the high income earners. But yeah, I think it really does speak to the experience of social democracy and proportional systems where you do have a coalition government and so you do have more cooperation and that is the norm or that's really the convention of that experience and the United States and Canada has something a little bit different but it's a tough question I think that why is it that voters in the United States and in Canada are so much more attracted to promises of reduced taxes versus some of the countries under proportional representation who do have parties that advocate for slashing the, you know, the tax rate, uh, but they don't win as many seats. They, they struggle to try to gain power. So I think with those social democracies, people do see the benefits that come with taxation, such as public services, public goods. I mean, affordable education and universal health care and those kinds of things. It really speaks to, I think, some serious cultural and social differences of individualism on one hand versus a more socialist scheme on the other. Yeah. Well, my greatest concern about the PR system is the, the likelihood of the rise of single racial parties. And, um, and as we see with the immigration crisis in Europe, the, some of those single issue parties can be very up. And in, in the system that uh, we're talking about, we seem to uh, give these people a, a, a bigger voice and to, to make them seem almost legal. And that, we as Canadians sit back and say, it will never happen to us here. But there's always the possibility of single issue parties becoming more and more uh, no, I, and that's a very well-founded concern, um, but that's that's supposing that the major parties will always have to work with those smaller parties. There have been examples in Europe where the main parties have specifically uh, come together to prevent the fringe parties from having any say in their policy because their, their views were too extreme. And, and in New Zealand, uh, one of the parties, one of the main parties was punished in the next election by allying with an extremist party. So uh, I think 
there is that danger, but parties have to tread carefully because our constitution requires that they face the electorate in a set number of years. And uh, they have to make their choices very wisely about who their coalition partners will be. I'm not even talking about having a coalition with these minor You're just minor worried about the voice. Okay. That's right. Sure. To, 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 to make these, um, these all right and all left groups um, legalized, <coughs> it's a real concern. Okay. And, and just to follow up, the, this gentleman described the system in in, um, in Germany where they have like 17 parties running, and and I and I think that now that we're seeing that that system is going down, it's hard to fix it. My question is possibly outside of the scope of this committee, but it's my question is about the Senate versus the the. House. One of my favorite subjects. And <laughs> if you have different systems that have different sort of strengths and weaknesses and whatever, what would be potentially the role of having a different system for electing the Senate than for electing the House, mm -hmm. and thereby possibly mitigating some of those problems of, of <coughs> one system versus another? If you have a, a certain system for electing the Senate that is more heavily um, localized, for example, and then a, a system for it to be collecting the house that's more proportional, then you could possibly have some of both worlds yes. in the two houses. And that's exactly the system they employ in Australia. And, um, you know, Australia, like, I remember during the election campaign, uh, a question was asked during one of the all candidates meetings, if you could pick a party, your party policy that you have trouble with, what would it be? And I said Senate abolition. And the results, the, the, the reason for that is because in 2013, uh, the government of Tony Abbott was elected with some pretty extreme views, even for, for what mainstream Australia was used to. Um, they came in with a very radical agenda, and it was only the upper house, the Senate, that by a few votes managed to add significant water to their wine and basically take control of that extreme legislative agenda and make it more um, acceptable to the mainstream of Australian society. Um, you know, I've had my troubles with, with our Canadian Senate, of course, um, but they certainly did redeem themselves in the most recent debate on Bill C-14 when they valiantly tried to bring about some of the amendments that we had been fighting for in the House of Commons and, and, and didn't succeed against the majority votes of the Liberals. Um, so I think you know there, there could be a role for the Senate in Canada as, as an upper chamber that gives sober second thought, but the current way uh, where it's unelected and unaccountable, uh, that is not okay. But I'm just citing Australia, maybe Mark can add to that, as, as that's a system where the lower house and the Senate are elected by different methods, and, and in cases it has worked very well for them. The United States? Yes. The, yeah. the Senate is usually a more sober, rational environment than the House of Representatives. Is probably not saying too much. <laughs> So we'll just have a few more questions. I think uh, yeah. New Zealand is probably a country a lot like ours mm -hmm. in many ways. It's only got 3 million people. Mm -hmm. But they went <coughs> to the mixed model in 1996. Mm -hmm. But to back up a comment made up there about fringe parties, we've actually had 41 new political parties listed since 1996. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, and when you read the names of them, you can see some of them are ridiculous, <coughs> some of them are single purpose. Some of them are religion, some of them are ethnic. There's all kinds of different things, but they don't get many votes, but they're all part of the system. And so it it's, could easily happen in Canada that we could spawn. But they weren't successful in getting a seat in the No, they weren't, but, they, but if you take, the, those votes get taken away from consideration mm -hmm. of other parties. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're letting people have their say at the ballot box, maybe they're satisfied with that. Well, that's yeah. okay, that's, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring a couple of points that you've just raised regarding the Senate together with the larger themes of this evening. Um, you could may you, or may not know this. Could you address the, the room? Could I'm you sorry. Because we can't hear a word you say. My apologies. Um, yeah. I have a bit of a cold and it's, it's probably coming up rather badly. My apologies. 
Um, I'm trying to, would like to draw together some of the points that were raised here regarding the Canadian Senate and the larger theme of this evening's meeting. Um, it may or may not be uh, something that the panel is aware of, but when the present Canadian Senate was formed, it was formed as a remedy to an elected body which represented property, which represented what we would now call provinces, and, and that was elected. Um, partisanship was a really big problem that they found in the active day-to-day -day operation of a chamber, which is supposed to be your advising chamber, because its powers are, in essence, equal to that of the lower chamber, which they then called the Legislative Council. In 1854, I'm sorry, in 1864, at the Quebec conference, uh, Sir John A. Macdonald and uh, Sir John Etienne Cartier met uh, and discussed the remedy for that is our existing Senate. The connection with what we're talking about here tonight, and by the way, I'm, I'm pleased that you're interested in Senate reform as opposed to abolition. I admire that. And my own, by the way, a proposal for that is that we use the, if we're use, going to use an appointing system, that those powers be taken out of the hands of the Prime Minister alone and be put in the hands a larger advisory body that already exists. It's called the Queen's Privy Council, and it's not to be confused with the Privy Council office. Uh, it is a body that consists of uh, past and present cabinet ministers and prime ministers, certain diplomats, uh, the uh, uh, past uh, chief justices of the Supreme Court of Canada. So it's across party line and it's across levels of government. Thereby, they can make recommendations based on merit, as so, opposed to, uh, yeah. as opposed. I just want to make time for other questions. Okay, so, yeah. I'll, I'll, the tie into what you're wanting to talk about here tonight about electoral reform is that party was the real concern that they had then, and that we must be concerned with that we're discussing here tonight. Yeah. I've heard a lot about party and not about who the members of parliament we elect actually represent, which are the people of the constituents or the riding. Very and so. that's important to Canada in terms of the risk of separatism. Because can you imagine if in the province of Quebec, they were told that the rest of Canada had elected a government that did not represent uh, the, sure. their aspirations uh, as a sovereign entity. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's my concern. Okay, yeah. But that is exactly what happened in the province of Quebec. In the 80s, when the Parti Québécois was held the majority, and they took the opportunity to restrict minority rights mm -hmm. and seriously restricted the rights of Anglophones. Um, and their rationale was well, this was a democratically elected majority, the majority rules. And uh, they, fortunately, we have our Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms. So this can happen in first past the post, as well as in um, uh, other uh, alternative systems. So we have to remember that. The majority can be a terrible dictator and, and seriously restrict the minority. As far as uh, being afraid to give fringe parties the voice, I would say we need to let them speak so we can answer them publicly. Otherwise, we drive them underground, they don't disappear, they don't go away, they're still there, and they spread their poison underground, where they get no rebuttal from anyone else, because we will not let them have voice. So um, we need, in my opinion, we need to uh, make our democracy far more successful where 61% of the population is not disenfranchised, or 63% as under the previous government. We need to enfranchise all our people, and then we will have a successful democracy. Thank you. Just one more question. Just I, I don't speak for any First Nations organization. I speak for myself as a First Nations individual. My name is Herb Rice. I, I, I've been involved in somewhat of the political arena since the mid-70s. When I look at political reform, I look at it as, well, it's another step. Bullshit. I mean, that's where it's going as far as I'm concerned. 
certainly I see more likable people stepping up to the plate, but they're, they're still hobbled. They're hobbled by corporation, they're hobbled by um, whoever is standing up and saying this is a democracy. They're hobbled by uh, lack of jobs, they're hobbled by no water on a reserve, they're hobbled by no low income housing. How do we look towards that as upper middle class people? I'm poor. I make between fifteen and thirty thousand dollars in a year. That's all I do. I'm an artist. I live as an artist. I enjoy that. But I come out with stuff like this. And certainly, it sounds good. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but come on. I mean, let's stand up and let's start walking forward. Let's start moving. Let's start doing something. I mean, I see my people, First Nations, around North America getting beaten, getting pushed into the ground, getting shoved into jail. They're all standing up for no pipeline. They're all standing up for more food. They're all standing up for better housing. They're getting killed. I've had relations killed in the Cowichan Valley here because they want to see political reform. I've had my late brother-in-law stand up and say, what happened to these people? They didn't commit suicide. They were killed in the Cowichan Valley. I see my relations getting beaten down as kids. I see them getting pushed out of stores, out of houses. Where does that leave me? I'm, I'm okay. I've spent 40 years in the political arena. I've hardened my skin. I'll speak out when I can. And I say, great. Talk, talk, talk. That's good. But to me, it's all bullshit. I may be part of the NDP party, but even that doesn't mean a whole lot to me because I still have to stand up to my own reform. Where are native issues in this political reform? They've been pushed forward since the inception of the Indian Act in the 1800s, the mid-1800s, when they were enacted. Nothing has happened. What I would like to see is political reform at that level that it acknowledges First Nations, um, maybe as their own government, self-government within the Canadian government, maybe having their own party. Why not? And it's my hope that if we reform our system to allow more voices who have previously been silenced or have never had a voice in our political system, then we actually have our country talking about those things and more importantly acting upon them. And the Maoris in New Zealand do have their own party and do have representatives. So We're precedent. still fighting to try and retain our treaty rights. Yeah. We're still fighting to try and retain our basic human rights. In Canada, democracy? Bullshit. That's what I'd say. Thank you. Robert, yes. I just like to point out to people that the Committee on Electoral Reform is open and receptive to ideas in the form of a brief, just a brief, right. which I have done. Okay, right. It's been accepted, translated in French, and will be circulated through the members of the committee. That's, right. That's available to any Canadian. Available to everyone in this room if you so wish. You can uh, submit individual reports directly to the committee. Absolutely. Pastor, I just wanted to do a shout out to one of your colleagues who's down in Victoria uh, working on Bill C-262. It's uh, Mr. Saganach. He's the, yeah, he's the first Indigenous MP in Quebec. Um, and he's talking a lot about the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights and trying to get Canada to actually implement it. Um, but also, you mentioned Nathan Cullen is going to be in Victoria on the 27th. They'll also be here this Saturday on the 10th for a town hall on electoral reform between 3 and 5. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah, he's with the other, the other MPs who are looking at together. But yeah, we're, we're thrilled to have Romeo come by because he, he does have that private member's bill to, to bring over that to the revolution. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you.
And Murray Ratton is holding the town hall right now right. on that issue of indigenous rights. So uh, just in the interest of time, uh, we've gone past the closing time. I just wanted to extend my, my personal thanks uh, first to, to Mark Williams, to Terry, for, for being great enough to stand up here with me and, and help make this an important discussion, but more importantly to you, the audience members, because really this is, this is your uh, issue, this is your say, and it's my hope that uh, we've allowed um, something where you can find a bit more information out, or, because one of the things the committee has found is that a, a shockingly low number of Canadians are even aware that the Electoral Reform Committee is even doing work right now. So it's my hope that through this informative session you can friend, inform friends and family about what's going on. And uh, I'm going to be very happy to take the feedback that you provide to my office and provide that to the electoral reform. So thank you for being a part of it and uh, fantastic to see you.